differentiate f of x equals e to the cotangent 3x over the square root of x and express your answer as a simple fraction. All right, let's start to differentiate. This is a quotient rule. I'm going to do it step by step because this one's a little complicated. So we start with the denominator times the derivative of the numerator, which is a triple chain rule. The outer is e to the cotan 3x. The derivative of e to something is e to something, so it's e to the cotangent 3x. We then take the derivative of cotangent 3x, which is minus cosecant squared 3x. Finally, we take the derivative of 3x to get 3. Okay, so we did the denominator times the derivative of the numerator. Minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator, which is 1 over 2 root x. Now, if you weren't able to see that that quickly, then you might want to rewrite root x as x to the half and then do a power rule. The derivative of x to the half is 1 half x to the minus a half. And the negative exponent means we bring it into the denominator and the fraction, the two, becomes a root. That's where this 1 over 2 root x comes from. Okay. And finally, in the denominator, we take the denominator squared of the original to get the denominator of the derivative as part of the quotient rule. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and multiply the top and the bottom of this fraction by 2 root x. The reason I'm doing that is because this is a complex fraction because we have this fraction within a fraction. So we have to get rid of this 2 root x. So I'm multiplying top and bottom by 2 root x, and I'm distributing the one on the top to the two terms, to this term and to this term. So I'm multiplying by 2 root x times this and 2 root x times this. Okay, and also, of course, on the bottom, we have to multiply by 2 root x. So over here, we have 3 times 2 and the minus sign gives us negative 6. Root x times root x is x. Cosecant squared 3x e to the cotangent 3x. Okay, and I've captured everything over here. Over here, the two root x cancels. The one in the denominator and the one in the numerator here go away, and we just get e to the cotangent 3x. And on the bottom, I just rewrote this as 2x root x. And that is now a simple fraction. The derivative of g of x equals x to the seventh over seven minus x to the sixth over five attains its minimum value at x equals, okay? The derivative of it. So first let's take the derivative of g of x equals x to the seventh over seven minus x to the sixth over fifth. Just two power rules, right? So seven comes down, cancels with the seven in the denominator, and we subtract one from the power to get six. And here the six comes down, no cancellation though, it's six over five and we subtract one to the exponent to get five. Now remember, we wanna minimize the derivative. That means we have to look at the derivative of the derivative or the second derivative. The second derivative is just another bunch of power rules, six x to the fifth, and we bring down the five that cancels with the five on the bottom, subtract one from the exponent, we get four, the six stays where it is. Okay, so we're going to factor the second derivative so it's easier to manage. We could factor out 6x to the fourth, and then we're left with x here and 1 here. Okay, now we'll go ahead and set the second derivative equal to 0 to find the critical numbers of the derivative, right? So we have 6x to the fourth times x minus 1 is equal to 0. We set each factor equal to 0, 6x to the fourth equal to 0, and x minus 1 equal to 0. Uh, 6x to the 4th is 0. We could divide by 6 and then take the 4th root of each side to just get 0. And for x minus 1 equals 0, we just add 1 to each side to get x equals 1. Those are the two critical numbers. Okay, now we can make a little sign chart where we put the two critical numbers, 0 and 1, as the cutoff points and split the real line into three pieces using those cutoff points. Then we'll go ahead and test a value in each of the intervals defined by 0 and 1 back into the second derivative. I would say let's test it right here in the fully factored form of the second derivative, or here. Okay, so for example, when we test a number to the right of one, for example, two, this is part is always positive, so we don't have to worry about it. It's just gonna be what we plug into here, right? So two minus one is a positive number, so this is positive. 
if we plug in a 0 0.5, 0 0.5 minus 1 is a negative number. And if we plug in negative 1, which is to the left of 0, negative 1 minus 1 is also a negative number. That means that the derivative is decreasing, decreasing, and then increasing, right? So the only possible place for that to be a minimum is at 1. You could see it from the little sketch that I did here. A point moves in a straight line so that its distance at time t from a fixed point of the line is 2t cubed minus 9t squared plus 12t. The total distance that the point travels from t equals 0 to t equals 4 is. Okay, so we're given a function here, or an expression, that gives us the distance from a fixed point. So at first glance, it might seem like, can't we just plug in 4 for t and 0 for t and subtract? And the answer is not necessarily because the point is moving in a straight line, but it could be changing direction. So usually we think of moving to the right as in the positive direction and the left is the negative direction. So before we could do those subtractions, we have to check for the places where the point might change direction. And that happens when the velocity is zero. So the velocity is the derivative of this expression, right? So uh, this is just a bunch of power rules. Bring down the three. So three times two is six t squared minus 18 t plus 12. And let's factor that. We could factor out a six to get t squared minus three t plus two. And then we could factor t squared minus three t plus two to get t minus one, t minus two. Let's just check t squared minus 2t minus 1t is minus 3t, negative 1 times negative 2 is positive 2. Great. So the point might change direction at t equals 1 and t equals 2. Now to finish this, we actually don't need to know whether it changes direction or not. We could just be extra cautious and split this up into pieces from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, and then from 2 to 4, and that will be safe. So if we let s of t, the position function, be 2t cubed minus 9t squared plus 12t, then if we just go ahead and compute s at these points, the starting point, 0, the two critical points, 1 and 2, and the end point, 4, then we'll have all our bases covered, right? So s of 0, you get from plugging in a 0 here, and you just get 0. s of 1 is 2 minus 9 plus 12, which is 5. Uh, S of 2, 2 cubed, that's 8 times 2 is 16, minus 9 times 4 is 36, plus 24, that gives us 4. And you could go ahead and check that when you plug a 4 in for t, you do in fact get 32. Okay, so now we'll get the total distance that was traveled by taking all the positive differences between these, 0 and 5, 5 and 4, and 4 and 32, right? So the total distance traveled is 5 minus 0 plus 5 minus 4, plus 32 minus 4. Notice that in going from s of 1 to s of 2, we switched direction, right? We did, instead of doing 4 minus 5, we did 5 minus 4. That's because we have to take the absolute value of all these differences to get distance, right? So you see that we get 5 plus 1 plus 28, which is 34. And that is the total distance. Once again, note that if we did instead s of 4 minus s of 0 to get 32, which would be wrong for this question, that's not the total distance, that would give the total displacement of the point. That's how far the point is from the starting point, but that's not how far the point actually traveled. The radius of a spherical balloon is decreasing at a constant rate of 0.5 centimeters per second. At the instant when the volume V becomes 288 pi cubic centimeters, what is the rate of decrease in square centimeters per second of the surface area of the balloon? All right, this is a related rates problem. So let's write down the information that we're given. So the radius of the balloon is decreasing at a constant rate of 0.5 centimeters per second, right? The decreasing at a constant rate, rate indicates derivative. This is a derivative with respect to time, right? The radius, dr dt, is at 0.5 centimeters per second, 0.5, and it's decreasing, so we make it negative, okay? And then I see that we're going to need to use volume, so I'll write down the formula for the volume of a sphere, because it's a spherical balloon, that's 4 thirds pi r cubed, 
And then we're also going to need the surface area formula. So surface area is 4 pi r squared. If you forget the surface area formula, you could get it from taking the derivative of the volume formula. Okay, and what are they asking for? They want us to find ds dt, right? The uh, uh, rate of decrease of the surface area of the balloon when the volume v is 288 pi. Okay, so... I'm going to start by figuring out what the radius is when the volume is 288 pi. And we can figure that out just by plugging in a 288 pi for V. Multiply each side of this equation by 3 fourths to get 216 is equal to R cubed. Uh, we've, and I also, I'm, I'm dividing out the pi's as well at the same time, right? Okay, so take the cube root of each side to get 6. So when the volume is 288 pi, the radius is 6. Okay, now we're ready to figure out what the rate of decrease is of the surface area. That means, again, it's a rate, so we want to take the derivative of s with respect to time. And that is 8 pi r by power rule times the derivative of r with respect to t. Right, the derivative of r with respect to t is what was given. It's negative 0.5. So when we simplify that, negative 0.5 times 8 is negative 4 pi r is what we're left with. And we want to find ds dt when r is 6, right? Because that's what we got when the volume was 288 pi. Okay, so we just go ahead and plug in the 6 there and we get negative 24 pi. So the surface area of the balloon is decreasing because of the negative at a rate of 24 pi centimeters squared per second. Consider the differential equation dy dx equals e to the y minus 1 times 2x cubed minus 5. Let y equals f of x be the particular solution to the differential equation that passes through 1, 1. Write an equation for the line tangent to the graph of f at the point 1, 1, and use the tangent line to approximate f of 1.1. Okay, so the first step is to write an equation for the line tangent to the graph of f at the point 1, 1. So we already have the derivative, right? And the slope is just the derivative at the point 1, 1. So the derivative is already given to us, so we're just going to plug in a 1 for x and a 1 for y to get uh, e to the 1 minus 1 times 2 times 1 cubed minus 5. 1 minus 1 is 0, so it's just e to the 0 times 2 minus 5. That's 1 times negative 3, which is negative 3. So that is the slope of the tangent line. And then we could just use the slope together with the point 1, 1 to write an equation of the tangent line in point slope form. y minus 1, the y coordinate of the point, equals the slope, negative 3, times x minus the x coordinate of the point. Okay, so that's the first part. That's an equation for the line tangent to the graph of f at point 1, 1. And now we'll use the tangent line to approximate f of 1.1. We just plug in a 1.1 for x, as I did right there. Okay, so 1.1 uh, minus 1 is just point 0.1. So we get negative 3 times point 0.1, which is negative point 0.3. And we just have to add 1 to each side of this equation. Negative point 0.3 plus 1 is point. Seven. So f of 1.1 is approximately 0.7. Consider the differential equation dy dx equals negative x squared over y. On the axes provided below, sketch a slope field for the differential equation at the 12 points indicated. Okay, notice that there are no points on the x-axis because uh, that's when y would be equal to zero and the derivative is undefined there. So we have six points above, above and six points below. Let's take a look at what the slope field would look like here, right? Notice that whenever um, x is zero, right? If we plug in a zero for x here, we get dy dx equals zero, which means there's a horizontal tangent line. So we draw little horizontal tangents whenever x is zero. Uh, let's do another point as an example. How about the point 1, 1? So at the point 1, 1, we're plugging in a 1 for x and a 1 for y. 1 squared is 1. So we just get negative 1. So the slope here is negative 1. As opposed to at, at 1, 2, we get 1 squared over 2. The slope is negative a half. So it's a little closer to horizontal than negative 1. Uh, more specifically, halfway to, to horizontal between here and the horizontal line. 
right? And you could go ahead and plug in the other values to see that all of these other slopes are accurate. Maybe pause the video and do that. Let h and k be twice differentiable functions such that h of one is negative four, h of eight is six, k of negative three is one, and k of two is equal to eight. Let f be the function given by f of x equals h of k of x, so the composition of those two functions. Is there a value c for c between negative 3 and 2 such that f prime of c is equal to 2? Justify your answer. All right. Well, since h and k are twice differentiable, they're certainly differentiable. Right? So therefore, f is differentiable because the composition of differentiable functions is differentiable. Right? In particular, since f is differentiable, it's also continuous, and in particular, it's continuous on the closed interval negative 3, 2, and differentiable on the open interval negative 3, 2. So the mean value theorem guarantees that there's a value c with c between negative 3 and 2, such that f prime of c is f of 2 minus f of negative 3 over 2 minus negative 3. And let's go ahead and compute that. Well, f of 2 is h of k of 2. f of negative 3 is h of k of negative 3. 2 minus negative 3 is 2 plus 3, right? So 2 plus 3 is 5. k of 2, remember, is 8. So we could plug that in there. k of negative 3 is 1. So we could plug that in there. And then h of 8 is 6. h of 1 is negative 4. So we have 6 minus negative 4 over 5, which is 10 over 5 or 2.